I think at times God definitely moved on my heart, and, and so we drive some points emphatically home. But if you got your Bible, turn to John chapter 6, and we're going to look at the first 14 verses. I have the toughest time. Uh, that wind was blowing on my mic a little bit. I could hear it, so I had to turn it down just a buzz. But uh, oftentimes I struggle at giving messages a title. But this week... It was, it was easy, and I don't know why it was easy, it just was. But I titled today's sermon, if you're taking notes, When Jesus Breaks the Bread, amen? I mean, we like to eat, I like to eat. You can look at me and tell that I like to eat. I mean, it's almost like an Olympic event. But, um, but when Jesus breaks the bread, I mean, you're in a good place when you're sitting and having a meal, and Jesus is there fixing to break the bread. Over the past few weeks, we've been, I've been preaching kind of, it's not much of a series, but kind of a series. We were following the same dialogue that, that when uh, we were looking at the miracles of Jesus today is going to stop this little series, but it's not the last miracle, but it was, I was starting to tread close to a sermon series I want to do leading into next Easter, and that's, uh, that's the I Am Statements of Christ. I want to, I've, I've wanted to preach through the I Am statements of Christ. I've not been really afforded the opportunity to do that. Y'all have afforded me the opportunity. And, and I, can I say, since I was voted in, this is the first Sunday morning that I've stood before you as a congregation as your pastor. So what, for whatever that's worth. I mean, y'all may have been thinking after about week two of YouTube, you was thinking we made a poor choice. But I tried to tell you that before y'all made the choice. But we'll leave that alone. But... Today we'll finish up with Jesus feeding the 5,000. It's, it's the most familiar account probably in the New Testament, maybe other than the death, uh, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It's one of the more, uh, we've learned this account all the way back in VBS. I mean, Lee didn't pay attention to VBS, but they taught it in VBS. Jesus fe feeds the 5,000, and, and we just did it again. So these kids maybe... They'll remember, I don't remember what he said, but I remember him bringing us up in front of the church and giving us some goldfish, and he talked about Jesus feeding the 5,000. And there's a, there's a lot more to the stories. We, we think about the stories that we learned as children in church, and, but then we get older, and we, and we learn, and the, we get the Holy Spirit, and we get to eating more meat, and we dive in God's Scripture, and we, we realize there was, there was so much more there than, than Jesus just taking a meal and feeding some people. Because I'm just going to be real honest with you. I'm not discounting what Jesus did, but let me just tell you what. If we poured our resources together, man, we could really feed some people even today if we wanted to. I mean, but what Jesus did was he did these miracles, and they were pointing to something else. And, and, and that's where I don't want to tread too close. I'm, as they say in, in, in the country world, in the farm world, you, gonna, you plow on close to the corn there, preacher. Well, I'm going to plow close to my own corn for the I Am Statement series that I want to do. But, but we, we've, learned this, we've learned this. It's in every gospel account. It's in, it's in every single one of them. And, and like I said, we started learning it in VBS. We learned it in Sunday school class and every age group growing on. But, there's, but when we read this account... On, on coloring sheets and crayons and, and, and even today where they got these word searches and they've got these goldfish, do we really grasp, and I'm talking to the adults here, do we really grasp what Jesus is doing here? Because he's doing a lot more than just taking a meal and saying, abracadabra, everybody let's eat. There's doing a lot more, and we're going to see that in just, uh, in just a second. What Jesus did there amongst this crowd uh, was more than just asking his Father to bless it too. It was a lot more than that, and we're going to get there. But, but what Jesus did in this moment is still being done here today in this hour of preaching and teaching. Jesus is still doing the same things, but you, you've just got to receive it and see it and understand it and, and know God's Word. This whole message is probably not going to be for you. You're probably going to hear me say some stuff, and, and you're going to think, well, well, I'm doing that, or, or I don't struggle in that area. Well, that's good. There's going to be one area that God's going to put his finger on, and that's the one that God wants to address. You know, I used to think, well, I used to listen to sermons. I'm like, well, I didn't really feel like the preacher was preaching to me that day. Well, there may have been about 40 minutes that he wasn't, but there may have been two that he was. Don't miss the two is what I'm trying to say. God has prepared an individual word for each and every one of our hearts this morning. 
Uh, God wants to change our lives through the preaching of the gospel, and he does that through a lifetime of incremental changes throughout our life. It's not, if he showed me who I was in 2008 and, and who he wanted me to be in 2020, I probably just would have went out and done like Judas and hung myself because I would have been like, there's no way I can get there. But with all the incremental changes that, that God has brought in my life, there's been great change over, a, uh, well, whatever it is, 2008 to 2020, but who cares? Johnny Hunt says it this way, God can do more with one step of obedience than he can do with a lifetime of learning. And that I say amen to because we, we as the church, we've, we've learned. There's, there's not a culture that, that has more information, more access to more information than we do. But yet we're the most learned and sophisticated culture of the day. But yet we, 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 we really lack in the obedience of taking a step forward. I, I always uh, uh, push you to Application Monday. Let's go out. On Application Monday, let's take what we've learned. Let's take it to our families first on Sunday at lunch and not, and not run roughshod over the cornbread when we gather for a meal. Uh, let's take it Sunday night when we lay the kids down for bed or when we get into bed. Let's take it Monday morning when we go out into the world. Let's take this and let's apply it to our lives. Let's dive in and read or we're never going to get done. And I didn't plan on going long anyway, so we better get going. And it says, After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is called the Sea of Tiberias, and then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up into the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And now the, the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near and then Jesus lifted up his eyes, seeing the, a great multitude coming towards him. And he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. And Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. And one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a lad who has five barley loaves and two small fish. What are that but what are they among so many? And then Jesus said, Make the people sit down. And now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in the number about five thousand. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he dis uh, distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down and likewise the fish as much as they wanted and so when they were filled he said to his disciples gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost therefore they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments of the barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten and then those men when they had seen the sign that Jesus did said this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. Let us pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we just thank you for today. We thank you for your word. And Lord, we thank you that it's alive and it's breathing. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It divides even the marrow and the spirit, Lord. And we just thank you. I pray that you would divide us now, Lord God, that you would just uh, penetrate deeply with the sword of your spirit. I pray, Lord, that you would change our hearts, change our minds. Lord, light a fire in liberty that we would go out into the highways, into the hedges in this community and homes, Lord, and make a difference. Lord, we, we're, we can't do it without you. Lord, we've seen what the world has try, tried to do for so many years without you. Lord, I don't know if we can get any smarter. I don't know if, if, if we can make it any easier. Lord, when you come, I pray that we would be found here at Liberty, taking the gospel to this world. Lord, would you hide me and help me in Jesus' name? Would you speak in Jesus' name? Amen. Right out of the gate in verse 2, there's a couple of questions I, that, that got posed to me, and they're for me and you. And the first one is this. Why do we come to church? I mean, why, why do we come to church? We've had eight weeks off. Uh, the coronavirus has not left. There's still cases being formed, but why do we come to church? Why do we come and gather in this building? I mean, what, 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 what is it about uh, coming and gathering? Why do we do that? I mean, is it, is it more than just 
uh, is just checking off a box. I mean, why do we come and gather? As I wrote this down. Uh, we know Hebrews 10, 23 and 25 tells us this. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another. That's one thing we need to get a better hold on in America. I need to get a better hold on. We need to learn how to consider other people's needs and, 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 and above ours sometimes. I, I need to really work on that sometimes. But it says, let us hold fast uh, confession without wavering for he who promises faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly. There's a lot of things that we've forsaken in this life, and most of them are not good things. But we have in America have really for, just forsaken the assembly of the gathering. There's something about when God's people gets together and they have a man from God that has a word from God to the people of the congregation, and we've really just lost that love. But I'm going to tell you what, I'm fired up this morning. I may not look like it, but I'm glad to see your faces because it gives me some feedback, and I'm not staring at blank chairs. I almost thought about putting some puppets out there or something where I could at least look over and smile every now and then. But I'm sure you heard Brother Charles every now and then. I'd get a little fiery or something, and and he'd, he'd give me an amen every now and then. Somebody, told, somebody called me and said, who was that giving them amens? I said, a man of God. And I needed him too because I was having a moment there. But, but so we, 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 we for, learned how to forsake the assembly. We forgot why we got together in the first place. You know what I mean? Kind of like some marriages. We kind of forgot why we got married in the first place. I mean, it, every, everything looks good, but whatever, whatever, uh, whatever, brings your marriage together is what it's going to take to keep it together. Amen? I don't even know who that's for. I, that wasn't even, that's not even in my notes. But, but why do we say that we follow Jesus? Why do we say that we follow Jesus? I mean, that, no, let me tell you what, what happened when I found, started following Jesus in 2008. I feel like I lost every single friend that I have. That's what I felt like happened to me. So why in the world does it profit me and you to say that we follow Jesus? What in the world does, is the gain of that? Jesus even said, uh, it's a shame for a man to gain the whole world but then lose his soul. I feel like I lost my whole world and gained Jesus. I feel like I lost every friend that I had because they were on the bar scene and doing everything else, and I ended up getting two deacons, all, all, uh, all old enough to collect Social Security. They, they were my new best friends. Is it status? Because we find that nowhere in Scripture if status is the reason why we come to church together. Every church in America that is moving and shaking for Christ has plenty of people riding on the coattails in this a Me Too movement. The people that's picked up bricks in the last few days that weren't the first folks to pick up bricks even though they were wrong and bash people's windows in, it was a Me Too movement. You want to know why your pastor has not spoke to the atrocities that's happened across America? Because everybody else has felt like they had to give their opinion. And what's this old boy's two cents going to matter at the end of the day? God placed me here on this earth to preach his gospel that it might change our lives here at Liberty Baptist Church, that we may go out those doors and we may make a difference in society. It doesn't make two rosy red rips what I think about what happened, even though what did happen to uh, Floyd, uh, uh, George Floyd, was murder. And some 2,000 years ago, the same thing was happening. And if it's not your answer today, my prayer is that one day soon, if someone asks you, where do you attend church? You might say one of the following statements. I serve. I serve. I serve at Liberty Baptist Church. Well, sir, ma'am, where do you serve? Or I teach so-and-so at Liberty Baptist Church. Do you think I ever thought that I would be a teacher or a preacher when I got saved? No. Let me tell you what my own father told me not long after I got saved when I took over a Sunday school class because mine and Casey's age group was leaving the church like the ACDC song, Highway to Hell. They were going out and not coming back in, and I saw that there was a need there. I had not long been saved, and I told, and I, told I stood up and I said, I went to a few of them, and I said, if I taught a Sunday school class, would you come? They said, if you'll teach it, we'll be there. So I went, and I told the pastor, I said, uh, I don't know a lot. I still don't. I said, but 
I, I, there's a need here, and I just, I just feel like God wants me to fill this need. And, and I remember when I went home, and I told my dad, you know, what my, you know what my own father told me? He said, son, you ought to be in a Sunday school class a little while before you teach one. <laughs> how, is that, how is that for a back pat and a neck hug? <laughs> and although I respect him, and he was right, because I probably said some stuff in that class that look back now I would not say. But bless God, God can take just a little bit. If you'll just put you, if you'll just put your name in the hat, He'll draw that sucker out. I hadn't won too much by that, so I don't know where that analogy comes from. If names go in the hat, I'm the last one drawn out. You know what I mean? Anyways, but or or say I lead this group at Liberty Baptist Church. I mean, we ought to be proud that we're a part of a, a local body. I mean, hey, because no, this, this is where God placed us. We ought to be proud of where we're from. I don't care if it don't look like this or it don't look like that. We ought to be proud that we worship God as a family together. Amen. Do you know why? Do you know why I just said what I said? I'm going to give you two answers because it means you're an actual functioning member. God didn't save you to a country club. I saw the book in the office, and I don't know who taught it before me. I don't know if it was Lamar or a pastor before him or the pastor before him, but it's, it was the autopsy of a deceased church and how to be a church member. Those books are in there on the shelf. I don't know if he taught them or just read them, but I taught them in Sunday school class at my other church. And, and we, ought to, we ought to not be sitters and getters. I'm going to say that till I die. We ought, we ought to just fit, see where we can fit in and plug in and plug in. And when we lead out, when we lead out with these type answers, I serve, I, I lead, I attend, I do these things. When we lead out in conversation, you know what happens? The, the, the door just gets pulled back a little bit further to have a gospel conversation that sometimes we think are so hard to formulate. God just lays it right there. I'm not much of a, a baseball player. I played intramural softball. And I even went down swinging one time, Josh. I even went down swinging. And, and I, I mean, I'm ashamed to say that because I'm like, who can't hit a softball? I mean, who can't hit a softball? But I grew up roping. I didn't grow up playing sports. So it was just, it was, I was just like, I was trying to fill a gap. They said, hey, you want to come play? I said, yeah. So anyways, I went down swinging one time, about throwing my back out. And, uh, but when we leave, God just lays us up a big layup right there just to, to knock it in. Let me tell you how much so. I wasn't even going to say this. There was a guy sitting at my father-in-law's driveway yesterday on a bicycle. And he was just sitting there looking at our horses in the field. And I stopped and I said, uh, I said, something wrong? And uh, he said, no. He said, man, he goes, I spent most of my life on Air Force Base. And he said, it's beautiful. Just to, he said, I like to just ride my bicycle right here and just watch the horses. Uh, and he said, man, it's just peaceful. He said, I spent my whole life in the military. And he said, I just, it just gives me a lot of peace. He said, you don't mind me sitting here, do you? And I said, no. And the longer we talk, he's a Christian. I'm a Christian. He found out I'm a pastor here at Liberty Baptist Church. And, and I mean, I had planned on nothing. I was just making sure it wasn't something wrong. His bicycle wasn't messed up. But God gives you these layups if you'll just, if you'll just put your name in the hat. Amen. In verse 5, we see an interesting exchange between Jesus and Philip. And we can plainly see that in verse 6 answers the question posed in verse 5. But let's consider it for a moment. Do any of you remember as a child a question like this? So, what, so let's just, we know what the question is. Jesus said, what did he say? He said, where shall we buy bread that all these people may eat? Do you think Jesus for one second didn't know where in the world they were going to get the bread from? Has your parents ever asked you a question and, and, and they caught you off guard though? And you're standing there and they caught you off guard and they asked you a question and you was like, boy, that is an idiot. I can't, let me help, I look here, you like, you step up to the plate when you knew you was going to knock it out of the park, Josh, and you said, Dad's such an idiot, I'm going to, excuse me, kids, I shouldn't have said that, Dad's such an unintelligent individual <laughs> that, that I'm just going to really bless his life and help him out because he's done got himself in a quandary here. He don't even know which way to go. And so you get up there to tee off just to figure out, Dad's not the moron you thought he was. He was just seeing what in the world you were going to do about it. That's what daddy was doing. He was just going to see what you were going to say. 
I know, amen. I, I, knew, I knew at least one somebody was going to get into that comment there, especially when you got boys. Maybe Mr. Andy since he had two girls. But anyways, but for a moment, would you think, we thought probably, how in the world did they make it this far in life, being my dad and mom? And, 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 and a question like this has got them stumped. But it's not the question that needs our attention. It's the response of Philip that needs our attention. Because Jesus, the creator of everything, he was not asking a question because he was dumbfounded for the first time since he made creation. I mean, he was probably dumbfounded when he, when he, because it says in Ephesians chapter 1 that he knew me and loved me before the foundations of the world. I would think if he was stumped or dumbfounded, he happened when he thought about September the 15th, 1983. That's my birthday. He's like, this one right here is going to be trouble. That's probably what he thought. But only to find out, find out late, moments later that, that, we're, that, 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 that our parents was just letting us know that the cat was out of the bag, so to speak. I mean, that's, that's really what it was for. But we don't know Jesus' tone or inflection here, but we do know that Philip... And we do know that Jesus was helping Philip look past himself and everything that he knew. When we see stuff and we feel like, I can't believe somebody would say that, maybe that question or statement was for us so that we could look past ourselves for a moment and actually consider what was being said. But so often times, so, so often in life, we want to listen to give a response, to run over somebody. We don't want to listen to hear what they have to say and consider it. I put a post on uh, Facebook this week uh, by Crossway, and, and it was talking about, uh, it was a Charles Spurgeon quote, and it was talking about the things that we consider, and, 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 and we don't consider it because it actually might be truth in our life. God didn't call us to be know-it-alls in this life. God, God called us to be leaners. Y'all know what I mean when I say that? Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all along. Leaning. That's how God wants us to. You know what? When you're leaning, that's not a battle position. That's a place where you've got unequal footing, and that's a place where you can get knocked off balance. You can get knocked down. But when you're leaning on the everlasting long arms of Jesus Christ, you're leaning in a safe place. Amen. We don't always have to have an answer for everything, and it's taken me a lot further in life, especially in my marriage when I've learned that, that I don't always have to tell Casey everything that I think she needs to know. Sometimes when she speaks to me, she just wants to vent, throw up on me. I go take a shower, come back out, and I say, hey, what's for dinner? That's, that's what you learn as you get older. Some questions that come our way are for us and never meant to be answered by us. Verse 7, Philip answers the question. He tells him that 200 denarii wouldn't be enough to buy bread to give them just a little bit. Now, it didn't take Philip long to come up with this. I mean, it was, it was Jesus said it, he considered it, he responded. When Jesus speaks to us, how long do we consider it before we respond? Because sometimes in my prayer life, I'm so busy just rattling off everything need that I think God needs to do at liberty, in my personal life, at work, and everything else, that I never give God a chance to respond. I mean, it's like three hours later, I'm driving two hours and 45 minutes to work, and God says, are, are you ready for me to speak yet? Because now I got you in this car and you're not going anywhere. You know, one of the McNuggets is not going to come in and ask for chocolate milk now. You can just sit here and listen a while. But he tells him what Jesus already knew anyways, but even if 200 denarii could get at least part of the job done, who had 200 days wages? Because that's what that represented was a day's wage. Who had 200 days wages just sitting on them in coin form way out in the middle of nowhere? I mean, if I'm going to go way out in the desert place to meet Jesus Christ, I'm not taking 200 days wages to weight me down. Well, I have to walk way out there to meet him. And neither are you. There is some sort of a crisis moment here, isn't it? I mean, Jesus wants to feed these people. There's obviously nowhere to get food. There's a crisis. 
Anywhere there's a crisis in Scripture or in our life, take heart. Jesus is getting ready to work. Now, he may not be getting ready to work on our timeline or the way that we have the picture painted in our mind, but he's getting ready to do a work. In verse 9, Andrew shouts out, there's a lad, and I don't know that he shouted it, but I'm a loud talker. But my father-in-law oftentimes messes with the kids that they learn how to whisper in a sawmill. If you've never been around a sawmill, that statement don't make any sense to you. But if you've been around a chainsaw or a sawmill, you know that uh, they don't know how to whisper. I mean, you don't tell them a secret because it's a loudspeaker uh, when you give them the secret. But I don't know that he shouted, but because I, when we read God's word, we inflect our, our thoughts and our motives and the way we do things on the characters in the Bible. So for me, Andrew shouted because I'm a loud talker. You don't ever have to worry about me. I used to get notes sent home every day. Lance can't be quiet. Well, I wasn't doing anything anybody else. I was just, you could just hear me. But Andrew shouts, there's a lad here that has five barley loaves and two small fish. And you may be sitting here right now and God's placing his finger on one particular thing, like I said earlier. And you know what? If he is, good. Good. I hope he is putting his thing on one particular thing. Because if you can sit under the preaching that God gives me week in and week out and God doesn't put his finger on it, I would suggest that either I need to go somewhere or you need to go somewhere else because that means either you're not an illegitimate son or daughter or, or I'm not a man of God after all. So I would challenge you in that. But while, um, while Philip was counting the cost, Andrew was out seeing what he could round up. That's a cowboy term. You know what it means to round up? You know, we see the City Slickers movie, and they say, hey, we're going on a roundup. You know what they were doing? They were out there gathering. A roundup's a gathering. You know what Andrew was out there doing? Jesus said he wanted to do something. Andrew sprung into action. He went out to gather up what he could gather up. That's what he was doing. It was his simple theology sometimes. And we have both of these types of personalities in this room, maybe even multiple ones. Somebody that's going to count every cost and somebody that's immediately going to be shot out of a cannon and move into action. That probably represents more than one of us on different levels. But at the end of verse 9, Andrew asked a beautiful question. And I want you to consider this for just a second. Jesus Andrew had brought this boy, the five barley loaves, the two fish. And what does Andrew say? What are they among so many? You may be thinking when that offering plate was passed a while ago or when it would be pa passed in a little while. What's what little bit I can give when we have such great needs? Every bit that you don't give is a need that's not met. I, I wish I could tell you some stories, and I will over time, about the Annie Armstrong offering. Because we were on YouTube, and it made it to somebody, and they heard. There's a man listening that will hear this message that's got stage four cancer in Nebraska. And him and his family have watched every message that Liberty Baptist Church has put on YouTube. You're reaching people with the things, the gifts that you give to this church, you're reaching people and you never know it. Our Bible says we entertain angels sometimes and we don't know that we're doing it. Our things do more than what we can see with just our hands and eyes. Amen. But he says, what are they among so many? And this question has plagued the church and our lives long enough. What is this among so many? Because when I feel like I can't when I feel like I can't adequately accommodate a need or something particular that somebody asks me for, you know what I do sometimes? I do the worst thing you could possibly do. I don't do anything. I'm like the servant that had one talent and he buried it because he didn't know what to do with it. If that's you today, I challenge you to make an appointment and get with me. Man, God puts you on this earth more than just more than what you're doing. I don't care what you're serving at, at what capacity. God really wants to be glorified and magnified in your life. And God didn't save us to just sit here and do nothing. I mean, we've done nothing long enough. 
I mean, you look at that. You you think that you think the church's lack of presence in 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 society is not a direct reflection of what's going on. I don't care if it's black, white, or indifferent out there doing what they're doing right now. It's the church's silence for so long. But not only is it the church's silence, it's the apathy of men and women that hear God's word and we refuse to do anything about it. I know that don't sound good, and I didn't like it when God gave it to me to put in this message. I'm not preaching at you. I'm sitting here saying, oh, me. But he saved us to do something with what he's given us. The trouble still remains, though, because we feel like we have to make it happen. And you know what happens when we feel like we have to make something happen? We make a mess. Because a lot of times we feel like we have to make a decision. If there's one thing through a season of waiting God has taught me is if I feel like I've got to do something, I've got to speak to this, I've got to do something else, that's normally not God. And that's not him saying, Lance, I need you to do that. If you think that, you probably need to just pull back a little bit and then let God speak over you of what actually needs to be done and needs to be said. But sometimes I can't do that. You know why? Because I'm selfish. You know what I want sometimes, Lee? I want the glory. You know what God said about when I want the glory? He said he can't have glory, but you know what that is? That's Baal worship because God don't share his glory with nobody. Verse 10 tells us that the disciples... Uh, to make the disciples, uh, tell the disciples to make the people sit down. And why did Jesus command these people to sit down? Why did he do that? Why did Jesus command these people to sit down? I mean, is it not enough that they already followed him way out to this deserted place to meet with him, to see him, to hear his teaching, to maybe get some healing? And now he's thinking, sit down. Go over here and sit down. Somebody, I can think what I would think. You ain't going to talk to me like that. I mean, because at this point, they didn't rightly know him as Jesus Christ anyways. They just thought he was a good prophet. Was it because it, that he wanted everyone to see? Is it because Jesus wanted everyone to see what he was about to do? Maybe. Maybe. Was it because he wanted to show off? Not a chance. That wasn't who he was. I believe it was because of obedience. And verse 11 and 12 backs that thought up. And it says, And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them, them to the disciples, and the disciples to those who? Sitting down. You know, I didn't catch that this, my whole life of reading this story. That's why I said God wants to say at least one thing to you today. Out of this whole story, my whole life, 36 years of being on this earth, I never knew that Jesus fed the people that sat down. So that when, it, when he says the people that were sitting down were filled, guess what that means? There were some knuckleheads like me that decided to keep standing because they weren't going to sit down. If you don't think for a second that Jesus Christ doesn't bless and honor the obedience of the saints, men and women, we got it wrong. Amen. Obedience does not get us Faith in Christ is fruit of our faith in Christ that we say he's master. And if you call somebody master, you better do what they say because otherwise they're not a master. In verse 13, the disciples gathered up more than they had to distribute. That word is killing me this morning. I, it's like a tongue twister every time. They're, they're gathering up more than they gave. Twelve full baskets from fragments of the five barley loaves and the two fish. Now let's land the plane here this morning. We've been here long enough. Y'all been, it's been good to see you. Why do you follow Jesus this morning? You don't have to tell me, but you will have to tell Jesus someday. Why, why do you follow Jesus? What is Jesus asking you for right now? And I'm not only talking about right now. I'm talking about tomorrow, next week, the rest of this year. What's Jesus asking you for? And if you don't know, I think it's time that we get along with him and we pray and we see what God wants us to do and how he wants us to. And I'm not talking about just giving you money. I'll, when I preach on tithing, I preach on time, talents, and treasures because it's a threefold gift that he gives us. He never asked me to give him something that he didn't replace it with that was much more. 
He never, Jesus has never asked me to give up anything that he's not giving me something that was much more, it was better, it was better than what I had. He's never asked me to do that, and I would challenge you, he's never asked you to do that either. He's not just this taker that we have, that, that, the, that the, the social world has him deemed, that he just takes and he's evil and that he puts these things on people that they can't bear. The main thing he wants is a personal relationship with me and you. And once he has that right, everything else seems like it becomes secondary issues. Do you know why we struggle with certain things in our life that we still struggle with? I'm not necessarily talking about health issues. I'm just talking about maybe we got a tick, maybe we got a hot button that gets us every time, makes us want to boil up on somebody and eat them up one side down the other. Because we ain't never gotten our prayer closet and asked God to do something with that hot button. If you're saved and you're actively serving with God's people for God's glory, are you praying and seeking ways that God could use his gifts that he's given you in this church and in this community. Are you doing that? It's only a gift if you give it, right? It's not a gift if there's some type of circumstance or some type of fee to pay for, for what you give somebody. That's not a gift. Salvation was a gift. Nothing we could do to earn it. It was paid for on Calvary's cross, cruel cross. And there was nothing we could do for it. It was a gift. What are we doing with the gifts God's given us? God can take a little bit, the little bit he's given us, and multiply it with his heavenly multiplication. In Malachi chapter 3, I believe it is, he said, I'll open up the windows of heaven and pour out on you so much a blessing, you can't even receive it all. We can't even fathom that here in America because we are blessed. But I think there's much more that God wants to do. It's my heart's desire that this that Liberty Baptist be a New Testament church. And we would bring our gifts that God's given us to the table and we would let Jesus Christ do what only he can do. When we pray about that. Father in heaven, we just thank you for today. Lord, as Amy comes to lead us in a time of invitation, Lord, I just pray and thank you for, Lord, how you gonna, how the people's going to respond. Lord, I thank you that we're able to get back in your house and Man, it's been a long time. Seems like it's been a long time. It's good to see our family's faces. But Lord, I pray that, I know this message wasn't super fun and it was a slant on the feeding of the 5,000 that maybe some of us hadn't thought of. But Lord, I, tell you, I pray you'd take this word and you would rub it down deep in our hearts. And Lord, that you'd help us be the men and women of God that you've called us to be with this precious blood-bought gift called salvation that you freely gave to men and women who did not deserve it, chiefly me. Lord, would you move in this time of invitation in Jesus' name. Amen.